All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. We started looking at the book of Esther a few weeks ago. We had to take a couple weeks off, but I noticed that introductory uh, file hasn't been uploaded yet. Maybe we'll find it and upload that. But let's go back to the book of Esther, chapter 1. Let me recap some of what we said. It was written approximately 475 B.C. Setting dates on historic events has always been a guessing game to my way of thinking because a lot of nations follow the old world calendar. It had fewer days than our solar calendar, which has 365 and a quarter days. And fixing dates, fixing months in certain years, B.C., A.D., always seemed to me a very Iffy, iffy proposition. But as best as we can sell, tell, um, the book of Esther was written for our benefit uh, about 475 B.C. And while the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we spent about a year and a half studying both of those books, concern the uh, history of the Jews who left Babylon and went back to Palestine after their captivity, the book of Esther deals with Jews who did not. Let me read verses 1 to 3. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, that's how it's pronounced, Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over an hundred and seven and twenty provinces, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign he made a feast unto all his princes, and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. This was the Median Persian Empire, which followed, uh, which overtook the Babylonian Empire during the time Israel was captive. The uh, um, Median or the Medes and the uh, Persians were two nations dwelling in that part of the world that we identify now as modern-day Iran. And it covered 127 provinces or cities, and they were spread far and wide from India, as verse 1 mentions, all the way to Ethiopia, which would be part of the African continent south of Palestine and across the Middle East. Uh, India is also mentioned in chapter 8, verse 9. Uh, China is referred to in at least one verse, just about everyone agrees, um, the um, land of Sinim, S-I-N-I-M, is a reference to China, Isaiah 49, verse 12. Kingdoms of the ancient world knew about one another more than we want to give them credit for. They were smarter than we realize. Modern man thinks the ancient civilizations were dumb and uneducated and ignorant until they come across some architectural feat that we couldn't reproduce today, and then they realized they were smarter than we realized, and we want to admit. And the capital of the Persian Empire, uh, Shushan the palace, as I said earlier, was located in what we would call southern Iran today. Let me continue reading verses 4, 5, and 6. When he showed the riches, the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even in hundred and fourscore days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver, upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. They are very patriotic, red, white, and blue, uh, as you notice at the end of verse 6 there. Verse 4 says, in hundred and four score days, that's 180. That would have been half of a year in the old world lunar calendar. Now couple that with the third year of his reign, mentioned in verse 3. It makes it three and a half years into the reign 
of this Persian king, this Gentile king. And to that end, Ahasuerus is a picture of a, a picture of the Antichrist during the first half of a seven-year tribulation when all seems well, when Israel has been restored and favored during the reign of the Antichrist. And not wanting to press it too far until I have a better understanding of it, and I'll confess I don't have a perfect understanding of it all, um, we can observe that the king holds a feast seven days long, mentioned in verse 5, quote, in the garden of the king's palace. The Bible says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for refuge, Psalm 48, verses 1 to 3. So King, by the way, uh, remember Psalm 48, verse 3, God is known in her palaces, plural, for a refuge. Whenever someone says, John 14 should read, in my father's house there are many rooms. Well, Psalm says God dwells in palaces, not rooms. Just compare scripture to scripture and you'll have the right understanding of where God dwells. He said, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, what house will you build me? So if heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool, there's plenty of room for everyone to have a palace. I've got a room. We've got a house. It has three rooms uh, and one and a half bathrooms. Um, got a kitchen, got a living room, even have a TV set. I don't watch it like I, you know, like a lot of people do, but uh, we have all those things. And God can certainly plan to give me something much more than that one day. So King Ahasuerus is simultaneously a type of Christ and um, a marriage in supper in heaven. Uh, among the elements listed in verse 6, you'll, read, you'll see gold and silver and also fine linen is mentioned there. At the judgment seat of Christ, a believer's works are compared to gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. And the fine linen is the righteousness of of saints, Revelation 19, verse 8 tells us. The beds mentioned also in verse 6, they weren't beds for sleeping, but they were reclining couches. Uh, the Orientals would recline as they ate. Look at Esther, look forward to Esther chapter 7. Esther 7, and verses 7 and 8. And the king, arising from the banquet uh, of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make re um, request for his life to Esther, the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. She wasn't laying on a sleeping bed. She was laying on a, a reclining couch when Haman decided to appeal to her. Also go forward to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 in the New Testament. John 13. Notice one verse here, a very short verse, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. They were all in a reclining position around the table at the Last Supper. Leonardo da Vinci's painting has it all wrong, where they're all sitting in chairs on one side of the table with an Italian landscape out the window. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. And um, we're getting close to it with the modern-day furniture designs. You see big sofas and... Um, um, what do they call it, sectional pieces in furniture stores where the, the sitting part is deeper than sofas used to be. So you lean all the way back and your feet don't even touch the floor any longer and you're in a real reclining position and then the host throws about 40 pillows on there for decoration. And uh, we're getting closer to that position as times go by. Uh, but back to our 
text here, and Esther 1, verses 7 and 8. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, a royal wine in abundance, according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, none did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house, they should do according to every man's pleasure. Verse 7 says, royal wine in abundance. You recall that Christ made uh, supernatural wine at a wedding feast in John chapter 2, the marriage of Cana. Go, if you will, also forward to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. And it says there in verse 29, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So there's that imagery represented in this feast. Verse 8 in the text says, And the drinking, excuse me, and the drink was according to the law, none did compel. There was no pressure to drink as there is in some societies where drinking is just a natural sport, is a national sport, national pastime. Uh, there was no stigma attached. There's no offense to the host. If you decide you don't want to drink, you could take it or leave it. Um, and the grace, you know, that's a great picture of the grace of God. It covers the affections of men and women and God doesn't force everybody to do the same thing the same way all the time. And God knows the personality of every man, every woman. He knows the personality of everybody that's ever trusted Jesus Christ. And he'll use them to reach somebody that the next believer can't reach. And uh, I wish we understood that better so that we'd know whether I should talk to that guy or shouldn't talk to that. Well, you should always talk to somebody. You never know. You might be the one that breaks through where somebody else couldn't. Um, but the grace of God will extend to Christians even after the rapture. And um, I'm glad God's grace covers you and I from day to day and even when we're asleep. If you acted on everything, every thought that ever came to your mind, your life would be a whole lot different. Aren't you glad you don't act upon everything? If everything you thought, every, every imagination of your heart, every secret plot you ever hatched in your mind as you're driving down the road, thinking about something at work, thinking about somebody that, that's getting in your way and you'd really rather not uh, deal with them any longer, some wicked thing you'd like to do that comes to your mind, uh, it's the grace of God that didn't strike you down for having wicked thoughts, dirty thoughts. Have you ever felt guilty about the dreams you had when you were sleeping? You ever thought about whether God's going to hold you to account for those things that come to your mind when you're sound asleep? I have. And the best advice I could give would be to beg God to forgive you for that too. There's no sin that God and the grace of God can't forgive. And or God is not willing to forgive, but you have to be willing to submit yourself to him, surrender yourself to him, and admit that you need his help. If you don't have the help of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to get very far in your Christian walk, in your Christian life with the Savior. Verse 9 in the text. <clears throat> On the seventh day, when the heart of the king, excuse me, that's verse 10. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. The king has made a feast for all his loyal subjects. Those who were loyal to him and faithful to him, he's given a great feast to and plenty of drink if they want, and a severe punishment to those who hadn't been loyal. This is an incentive plan of keeping those loyal loyal and keeping them faithful to him. And the queen is entertaining the women of the kingdom. Uh, go forward, if you will, at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 
Ephesians 3, and two verses there, verses 5 and 6. Ephesians 3, verses 5 and 6, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise by, excuse me, in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. God, it is a picture of a Gentile bride being called out in the story of Vashti the queen. She typifies a Gentile bride being called out during this current age when, uh, when the gospel is being preached to the, to the extent that King Ahasuerus typifies Christ. In that regard, as, long, as much as he typifies Christ, his wife typified a Gentile bride, and he called out for her attention. Um, at the beginning of the church age, God showed favor to the Jews because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want you to uh, go forward to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, Acts 13, and notice two verses there, verses 45 and 46. Acts 13, verses 45 and 46, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Also, uh, later in Acts 18, verse 6, and Acts 28, verse 28, which you don't need to turn there tonight. When the nation of Israel kept resisting the preaching of the gospel, and the pre preaching of the Messiah in the Lord Jesus Christ, God began to displace the nation of Israel and began to extend the gospel to the Gentiles as well. A called out bride, called out body, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. Uh, he came unto his own Israel, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, Jew or Gentile, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 11 and 12. The Bible says that blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, and as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, Romans 11, verses 25 and 26. You and I, by the way, the first mention of Gentiles in the Bible was a reference to the descendants of Japheth, the Caucasian races in the world, back in Genesis chapter 10. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their land, in their nations. And uh, right now, the Gentile nations, primarily white Anglo-Saxon races, run the world's politics. They run the world's governments. They run just about every major enterprise in the world. And uh, fewer and fewer people uh, among those populations, white Anglo-European uh, races, are turning to Jesus Christ. Some still are, and we thank the Lord for those that are. And we're thankful for those who uh, catch our sermons on the Internet and actually get some instruction, some blessing from it. We hear from them from time to time. But as a general rule, uh, there are not sweeping revivals among white, uh, the white races as there once were. There are increasing revivals among the Shemitic races. You hear about people in uh, Arabic uh, and Muslim countries turning to Christ, of course, facing great danger from their families and their own nation for doing so, and in African countries as well. But uh, the times, the fullness of the Gentiles running the world's affairs is beginning to dim. It's beginning to uh, come to a close. 
and God will eventually restore Israel to its place of national prominence once again. Now Malachi 3 verse 6 says, I am the Lord God, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Because God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a long time ago. He plans to keep those, to fulfill those promises. And so no one's been able to destroy the Jew. That's why the Jews, I know the, I know the word of God, uh, or rather, I know the Lord God of the Bible must exist because the people of the Bible still exist. That's one of the most miraculous proofs you could offer to somebody. Uh, a nation or a race of people who other governments hated and despised and tried to destroy, but couldn't. And uh, Dr. Ruckman would be great at talking, uh, extolling how efficient the German killing machine was. There's one thing he was very proud of was his German ancestry. And he was proud that when, uh, you know, the Americans, we, we think we're, we've sweated off when we've worked a 40 hour a week uh, a work week, but he'd be bragging about Germans willing to work 60, 65, 70 hours and not complain. Yeah, but that was then, that, today is now. Do you realize that when you average out the, the total number of part-time workers with the total number of full-time workers, the average work week in Germany is 29 hours from what I recently heard. But as a race or as a nation, they are more productive than nearly every other country in their manufacturing and technological achievements. But be that as it is, very few people uh, are have been as efficient as the German nation. Not to give credit where it's due. But No one was able to destroy the Jew. Not the German army, not the... The Catholic Church has despised it. They wanted to blame the Jews for murdering the Messiah, murdering Christ. And therefore, you were a good Catholic if you took, uh, adopted uh, anti-Semitic sentiments, anti-Semitic feelings, because the Jews run everything. They have the, they've got their hand in the finances of the world everywhere you go. Uh, which isn't true, which isn't true. It's just that uh, those who do stand out among Jewish people have been very successful, and it's envy. Jealousy is the rage of a man, Proverbs 6 says. And so uh, what Dr. Ruck used to say, Pete, um, Jews know how to make money, Gentiles like money. And um, that's about what's going on. But the the... Nations of the Gentiles running the world's politics, the fullness of the Gentiles is about to come to a conclusion, come to a head. That's why so much in the news today uh, centers on China, centers on South Korea or North Korea, it uh, centers on the Middle Eastern nations, the uh, Shemitic nations, it centers on Israel. And all the focus of the world's attention is coming back to Israel once again, where God started it. It's worked its way around the world. Uh, my wife gave me a very good book called The Decline of Europe by a, by a Brit named um, Murray. Hmm? Oh, Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray, he's a young man. He's got some very astute observations about Islam and the, uh, the uh, flood of uh, Muslim immigrants into Great Britain, into France, and so forth. But uh, his problem is he used to be a member of the Church of England, and he left it because it left him empty, and now he considers himself an atheist. So, so you, you, know, you, you take the nut and throw away the shell when you, you read something like that from an author like that. But he doesn't take into account that the Church of England abandoned the King James Bible. They abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they just decided to embrace old, stuffy uh, religion that had no life to it. And uh, these big cathedrals are mausoleums. There's more death in there than there is in an actual mausoleum, a lot of cases. Uh, well, let's read down through, oh, I think down through verse 16, and then we'll conclude for tonight. I'm going to pick up there, God willing, next time, starting at verse 10. 
On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and uh, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass. By the way, Brother Justin, if you're looking for baby names, tell your wife there's a few there. Um, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was there the king's manner toward all, the, all that knew law and judgment. Uh, and the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meriz, Marsina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face, and which sat the first uh, in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus in the chamberlains, by the chamberlains? And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. We'll stop right there. You can see she's about to get herself in trouble with the king. And uh, the story unfolds, and a great deliverance of the Jews is told in the story of Esther, coming out of nowhere as a young Jewish woman to become the queen of the empire, and the Gentile queen is rejected and replaced once again with a Jewish queen. A great prophetic picture of God ending his dealings with the Gentile nations uh, at the coming again of Christ, the rapture, and turning his focus to the Jew once again and preserving the Jew all the way into their kingdom of a thousand years. 